And good morning, everyone. Welcome to our study as we continue studying the book of Luke. We've been working in Luke chapter 13. Okay, <laughs> they're working on it. <laughs> so I'll try to speak up a little louder until we get it. We are working from the book of Luke chapter 14. We'll do the best we can. <clears throat> we are working from the book of Luke chapter 14. And what we are finding as we are continuing our study is that Christ Jesus is causing a lot of problems on the Sabbath. And what we're going to find today is he's not doing anything any differently. We find this day that Jesus is a dinner guest. And Jesus is never a dull dinner, the dinner guest, not at all. During his ministry from town to town, he was invited to eat at many different places. He ate with poor people. He ate with wealthy people. And regardless of what he always had something worth doing. And I was amazed when I was studying this to see how Jesus set the agenda for the discussion at these meals rather than allowing the individuals themselves to set the agenda. So as we begin, let us pray. Our blessed Heavenly Father, sometimes we, when we look at our lives and ourselves and our motives and emotions and interpretations and values, Father, sometimes we can be as cynical as the Pharisees that we see sitting at this table that we are about to study today. So, Father, we pray to you that you cleanse us. Father, we pray that you renew us. Father, we pray that you protect, perfect us. And Father, we pray that you refine our motives so that your heart might fill our heart and your desires might become our desires. Father, forgive us and make us whole. Father, it is in Christ Jesus' most holy name that we pray. Amen. I don't know if this is going to work for 45 minutes yelling like this, but we'll see. When we turn our attention to the first verse of our text at verse 14, uh, ch uh, chapter 14, verse 1, the Bible reads, One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. Now, as I said earlier, Christ Jesus had gone to a lot of dinners. He had been invited to a lot of dinners. He had been the guest of tax collectors. He had been the guest of friends. And now he's, whoa. <laughs> okay, I'll tone it down. And now, and now he's the guest of an influential Pharisee. He's the guest of a leader of the Pharisees. This man and his friends, well, they have invited Jesus there not because they really wanted him there as a great guest and a great friend, but they had invited him there because they wanted to see how he observed the niceties of their interpretations of the law. The Greek word that would be used here, that was used here to describe their intentions, when we look at it and study it, what we find it means is watch closely, observe carefully, Observe someone, see what that person does. From the context, it can take on the meaning of watch maliciously. 
lie in wait for. Now, what ends up happening with all of this planning, with all of this scheming, if you will, what ends up happening is that, is that the Pharisees themselves are examined. And when the Pharisees are exa examined, we have to say, what were they examined for? How were they examined? Well, Christ Jesus was looking at their biblical interpretation. He was looking at their motives. He was looking at their values. Now, since this was the Sabbath, all the food would have had to have been prepared on that Friday before 6 p.m. for a dinner this large. And their guests included, you, 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 we figured it did include Christ Jesus, G, uh, his disciples, the Pharisees' hosts, as well as fellow Pharisees. Now, fire wasn't allowed to be tended on the Sabbath. So what would have happened is the food would have been prepared before sundown on Friday, and it would have been kept warm. And uh, because they were preparing meals for that Friday evening, which after 6 p.m., they would also have, been, have a meal prepared for Saturday morning, and a meal, a light meal, would have been prepared for um, Saturday afternoon after the prayer. Now, we're not sure which of those meals Christ Jesus was attending here, but it's fair to say that he more than likely would have been at the most elaborate one, which would have taken place on Friday after 6 p.m., So we turn our attention to verse 2 in the Bible reads, There in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Now, think about this for a moment. One of the men at the meal was afflicted with dropsy. That's an archaic term by today, but it's another term that was used for it was edema, edema, which is an abnormal accumulation of fluid in the cavities and tissues and it was visible perhaps by puffiness in the face and swelling in the legs. And we have to realize something, it is not so much a disease, but rather it was a symptom. It was a symptom of, of an underlying, uh, much more serious problem, such as congestive heart disease, liver disease, kidney disease. But however we look at it, it's fair to say that this man was very ill. He was very ill. It's amazing how you get off track. Thank you. Thank you, James. Now, some think that this man, and people tend to do this, you know, they look at motives for everything because we have motives and we do things for reasons. So, so some would look at this and say, okay, here's a man with dropsy. Why was he there? We know he was very ill. So some would say he was a plant. He was brought into this dinner for one purpose and one purpose only, to see if Christ Jesus was going to heal somebody on the Sabbath again. And others wondered why a diseased man would even be allowed at a Sabbath meal. Because, you know, the Pharisees looked at themselves as, a, as, as obsessive with ritual cleanliness. So why would you have a diseased man at this function? After all, he might render them unclean. But really, I would prefer to think that some of these people there at least with looking at this differently. I, I would think that he was a wealthy uh, Pharisee as well, that he was probably overweight for some time and was now suffering from some type of fluid retention, that he was very ill. But at the same time, it's, it was fair to say he didn't have any symptoms at all that would render him unclean or ceremonially unclean, other than the fact he was in poor health. I would like to think that some of his friends who were sitting there, they would have been happy that he was able to join them on the Sabbath. It's kind of like here when we see someone come to services that one of our shut-ins that hasn't been able to be here for a while. I would think we would be happy that that person was here to join us in worship so that, and to join us as we partake of the Lord's Supper together. I would think we would be overjoyed with that. Because like in this person's case, you know, it might be the last opportunity this person would have to be with them, and the person may have, be, have the last opportunity to be with us as well. But in any case, I don't know for sure, but it just so happens as we look back at our text that this man is sitting right there in front of Christ Jesus. And Christ Jesus couldn't help but notice him and his condition and feel concerned for him. But again, I say to you, the Pharisees are watching. 
They are watching. They want to know what Christ Jesus is going to do. They want to know whether or not he is going to break the law again. And they were probably thinking, will he wash his hands in a ritual fashion? Will he commit some other breach of their laws? Will he heal? Well, Jesus observes this suffering man. He observes him, but he doesn't directly do anything, but rather he used an indirectly approach. What he did was he asked permission. He asked permission. We look at... Okay, I have really gotten myself off track now. Let me back up one... That's okay. I forgot to put this slide in there. I had a senior moment, fellas. <laughs> okay. We're close. In, ch in chapter 14, at verse 3 and 4, the Bible reads, Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Uh-huh. Silent is golden. There we go. They could have answered. They could have tried to argue the position that a physician can't perform his duties uh, on the Sabbath, but they, they did have some rules that was kind of interesting. It was okay to bandage a wound to keep it from getting worse, but, uh, 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 but at the same time, you couldn't do anything that would treat a wound to... Uh, uh, unless it was actually life-threatening. So you keep it from getting it worse. If the person is not going to die right away, leave it alone. That was their rules, okay? So the question is, why doesn't the scribes and the Pharisees answer? Are they just simply going to let Christ Jesus hang himself? Well, perhaps they were aware of something that had taken place when we read back in uh, Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 7, how Christ Jesus basically demolished the synagogue leaders when he healed the woman who had been afflicted for 18 years. Or, 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 do they secretly know that when you turn your attention to mosaic law that it doesn't prohibit healing on the Sabbath that when we look at that activity on the Sabbath it was more rabbinical rules rather than mosaic law we don't know maybe it was a combination of all of these things we just don't know but we do know this none of them spoke up none of them spoke up and because of this no one can accuse Christ Jesus of wrongdoing when he heals this man. And Jesus saw to that the way he presented his question to them in the beginning. He asked them, is it lawful? That should be 14 verse 4b, not 14b. At verse 4, the Bible reads, So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him away. Now, Jesus took hold of the man. Now, the Greek word that was used there could mean to make the motion of grasping or taking hold of something, make the motion of taking hold of, grasp, catch. It probably means that Jesus took the man by the hand, which is something we see, for instance, if we look at Mark chapter 1, verse 31, as well as chapter 4, or 5, verse 41, or, or we look at Acts chapter 3, verse 7. As we continue reading, we see that Luke records later that, uh, in the same event, that Jesus healed the man. Now, the next action is interesting. In most translations, we would render this, when we see it in the NIV, he would say that he sent him away. The Greek word that it used there can also be a legal term, which means to acquit, to release, or let go, send away, dismiss. Again, when we look at a previous chapter of our study, the same word is used regarding the woman who had been infirm for 18 years. And it was used in a sense of release from pain or a painful condition. She was set free. Uh, as we said in that particular lesson, Christ Jesus sets us free from Satan. Satan imprisoned us. Christ Jesus sets us free. Now, I don't see... When I think about this, why would Jesus heal the man who came to dinner, 
and then just send him away from the dinner. That doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense here, but I can see it going something like this. Christ Jesus taking hold of the man's hand, healing him, and then setting him free from his disease. That makes a lot more sense than, than just basically healing him and telling him to go home, especially when we look at the words, the various Greek words that were used to help us understand this passage a little bit more. So we turn our attention to verses um, five and six. The Bible reads, then he asked them, if one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? And they again had nothing to say. It's amazing how people keep silent when they know they're wrong and what they're doing. In the synagogue, when we think back at verse 13, uh, chapter 13 at verse 15, in the synagogue when the bent woman was healed, or the woman with the infirmity was healed on the Sabbath, Jesus alludes to their practice of uh, watering their animals on the Sabbath, but not wanting to help people. Here he refers to the exception on the Sabbath of, of rescuing one whose life was threatened. And he went on to say if a son or an animal had fallen into a pit, surely they wouldn't wait until sundown on Saturday before they did something to help. Jesus was saying to them, if you needed to, they would find some way to justify pulling the sun out of the pit to pull the animal out of the pit on the Sabbath. They would not leave him there. There was a gentleman by the name of Leon, Her uh, Leon Morris. His comments about this went like this. The clear implication of all of this is that deeds of mercy are in order on the Sabbath. But again, when the question was put to the Pharisees, what did they do? They kept silent. So the question is, what can, they, what can they say? What could they say? I think about this and I was saying, why wouldn't they say the obvious? Why wouldn't they say the obvious? After all, this was one of them that was healed. He was very ill. Why wouldn't they say the obvious? Why wouldn't say, they say something like, how wonderful our friend, a fellow Pharisee who was gravely ill, has been healed? But instead, they kept silent. They kept silent. When we look at this dinner scene, um, there's a lot of marvelous healing taking place here, a lot of it. But there's something else that's taking place here at this dinner scene. Because you see, the guests, it appears, care only for themselves. It's all about them and not for those less fortunate than themselves. For instance, this man with dropsy, a fellow Pharisee. Their agenda at the dinner was primarily about themselves. We look at our text at verses 7 through 9, and the Bible reads, When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. There was a pecking order. There was a pecking order among this group. So we had Jesus and his disciples. They probably arrived there a little bit earlier just so that they could see what was going on. There were no place cards like we used to see them when we come to, to, to our luncheons and banquets and stuff with our name on it. This is where we're going to sit. There were no place cards there. So the guests basically come in and they seat themselves. And most guests came in looking for the most honorable place to sit. They wanted to, because they knew where they sat in reference to the host that told everyone how important they were. And we think about this, even Jesus' own disciples, James and John at one time, because you remember how their mother intervened for them, they were seeking to be on the right and on the left. So they wanted places of honor too, and, but we know on, on the crucifixion, or at the crucifixion, two thieves got that honor, one being on the left and one being on the right. But apparently at a Jewish meal, the top place 
was at the head of the table or if it was set up with sofas, there was a middle sofa and the person normally sat in the middle of the middle sofa. But, but, the guests were not really free to sit where they desired because the host, if someone more important comes in, wouldn't mind going over to that person saying, I need you to get up and move and I want you to sit right there. And then they will take that person to one of the least desirable spots because that was the only spot that was open. And what will end up happening is uh, a great deal of humiliation can take place that way because all of those people you were trying to make think you were so important, they see you being told to move and go to a least important spot. And you might say it's a time of big time embarrassment when things like that happen. So, but the bottom line is just right here. We shouldn't overreach us, ourselves. Uh, when, you stand, when you overreach yourselves in your social standing, you, we can get publicly humiliated. We turn our attention to verses 11 and 12. The Bible reads, but when you are invited, take the Lord's place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So Jesus, he recommends to this group of people that they should take a more humble spot then they might be happily surprised if the host asked them to move closer to where they are sitting. There's a moral to this. It goes back to verse 11. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. We look at what was taking place here at this dinner. One minute, Jesus used a very current example of worldly jockeying for position. And in the next, he's drawing a spiritual application, if you will. And the spiritual application is this. It's not just a dinner, a dinner host who might humble us, but God himself. Therefore, don't presume on our position, but be humble before God. And by doing that, we let God exalt us not ourselves. We've all had people over for dinner, and luck, hopefully we don't get into this order of importance. But can you imagine being this pointed at dinner? Can you imagine being at dinner and telling somebody, get up and move? In our culture, it would be considered rude to do that. And it probably was rude in Christ Jesus' culture as well during the first century. But you see, Jesus is trying to teach kingdom principles to some curious, to some religious, but also selfish and hard-headed individuals. And the only way he's going to be able to break through to them is use, I guess you might call it shock treatment. Whatever the case, I would venture to say that everyone who was at that dinner that day, they did not forget a thing about what happened, and they remembered it for a long time. Okay. Okay. But Jesus' pointed comments aren't over yet. It's not over yet. See, he talked about the social climbing motives of the guests. Now he turns to the host and the motives of the host. Now, we Americans, some of us, we, uh, we like to consider ourselves egalitarians. And what do you call it? Equality for all. But we don't always practice that. We just pretend, we just say we are, some of us. So I'm saying this because when we take other cultures that have a stronger awareness of class distinctions, they may understand what Christ Jesus is saying here better than a lot of us. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Joel B. Green that wrote this. Because meals were used to publicize and reinforce social hierarchy, 
Invitations to meals were themselves carefully considered so as to allow to one's table only one's own inner circle are only those persons whose presence at one's table would either enhance or at least preserve one's social status. So we go back to this room here. We go back to this room. And I jumped ahead of myself a little bit, but that's okay. So we go back to this room and imagine a room full of people. It's a room full of guests. We got the Pharisees there. We have the host, uh, his host peers that look up to him as a leader. We have Christ Jesus there. We have his disciples. Christ Jesus is the honored guest of the day. And presumably, Christ Jesus' disciples again would be there with him. Christ Jesus, socially, hey, he was inferior to the Pharisees socially, at least in that town. But his fame, it had definitely preceded him. And his presence brought prestige to the host. He would be the one remembered in town as the one who invited this, this fellow from Galilee, this preacher from Galilee. He's a bit on unorthodox, but he's famous. But you see, this dinner, when we look at it, it wasn't about helping others. It was about helping oneself. It was about advancing oneself. It was about moving forward in the social, ma social matrix. These guests that was there at this particular event seemed to be especially, um, what well, didn't seem to be especially concerned about the man with dropsy by no means. All they were concerned about was whether or not Christ Jesus was gonna mess up again. They was just wanted to know if he was gonna mess up again. The meal wasn't about enjoying Jesus. It wasn't about enjoying his company. It wasn't about learning from him. It was more about enhancing their status. So Jesus brings us to another parable. At verses 12 through 14, and the Bible reads, Then Jesus said to his hosts, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends your brothers or relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So Jesus is saying to them and he's saying to us as well, that when we hold a, hold a special meal, we need to be careful who we invite. We meet, need to invite those who are least able to reciprocate. We need to do it out of love. We need to invite out of the goodness of our heart. We need to invite the poor, we need to invite the cripple, we need to invite the lame, we need to invite the blind. Now somebody might be saying, well James, do we know that many people that fall in that category? Well, if we go back to uh, Mark chapter 11, yeah, we do. Because when the apostle, well, I'm sorry, when John the baptizer sent his, his disciples to Christ Jesus and asked if he was the one, or should they seek another, Christ Jesus alluded to the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And yeah, he was talking about those with physical illnesses, but he was also talking about those with spiritual illnesses in that we are spiritually poor, we are spiritually crippled, we are spiritually lame, we are spiritually blind. So he's saying don't look for status. Bless them with your generosity. Did it, I hope everyone heard what he said. <laughs> but I, I can agree with you on that. Um, he does know our motives. He does know our heart. And 
I'll get to another point in a minute. We need to be aware that God does know this. And Christ Jesus knew their motives. He knew their heart. He knew what it was about. It, this man was dropsy. For some of them sitting there, if not all of them, they could care less. It was all about, can I jack him up? And at the same time, I can let everybody know I had Jesus at my house. Thank you. Um, yes. So if we approach this with this attitude, what we would find that God will reward us. God will reward you. In the same kind of, now, when we look at these two parables, there are two parables we've looked at here. We looked at a parable from uh, verses 7 through 11, and we looked at a parable from verses tw uh, 12 through 14. One, we can look at it and call it the parable of the places at the table. The other, the parable of the guests invited to dinner. But there's a focal point, there is a focal point that I want us to get to, okay, yes. There's a focal point that I want us to get to and it's this right here. Don't exalt yourself, let God exalt you. Don't exalt yourself, let God exalt you. So instead of letting your actions be controlled by what it will do for you, rather, kind of like Danny was talking about here, rather, what will bless someone else? Turn your focus uh, from inward to outward. You know, I think about it sometimes when, when I come here, because sometimes we, we come to church and we are just thinking, what's in it for me? What's in it for me, right? And, and, and sometimes I look and I, I see this group over here and Everybody over here is suffering, they're having problems, and they're thinking that these two groups over here got it made, they, they've arrived. But at the same time, you have this group right here suffering, thinking everybody over there got it easy, got it made. Or you got this group over here suffering, they're thinking everybody else over there got it made. And sometimes we sitting out there think the person standing up here don't have problems, don't, don't have suffering going on in their life, don't have difficulties. So when we come to church, our mindset should be not just getting, not just giving, but actually getting and receiving. Because even though we walk in the door suffering, we can still bless someone else. And that's what we should be looking at doing with one another. Not just walking the door saying, what am I gonna get today? I'm not getting anything out of this. What are we putting into it? We, we get out what we put in. So, so let's keep that in mind too as well. So in a wonderful way here, in a wonderful way, in the parable of the guests invited to dinner, Jesus is asking the host to be like God. He's asking him to be like God. You see, God invites us to his own table and he invites not those who can do something for him. He doesn't invite us because we can bring him expensive gifts. He doesn't invite us because we can lay all of this praise upon him. But rather, God invites us, and that's all of us in here, who are hurting, who are oppressed or depressed. We don't really have a lot to bring to him other than ourselves. We're crushed. We're brokenhearted. God is inviting us to his table. The Father invites us to his table, not to help himself, but to help us. Not to receive a blessing, but to, so that he can bless us. And that's something we need to keep in mind. No one in here has arrived to the point where we do not have problems. There's not a person in this room in the past year can't say they don't know someone that they love, well, in the, in the, just this year, that can't say they don't love, uh, so they haven't lost someone that they love dearly in death, that they don't have a loved one that's very ill and dying, that they're, they're, they're not having a problem in their marriage or with their children or whatever in their life period. So why in the world would we come here acting like we have arrived and we don't have those problems anymore? We do, every one of us. So we need to stop thinking everybody else got it so much better than us and just realize we all have it good because of Christ Jesus. We all have it good because of him. 
but we still have those problems in our life. And he can give us the strength from God to help us bear it. But please stop thinking that I'm the only one suffering. I must not be a good Christian. We all suffer. We all have our difficulties. Many times in the church, many times in the church and in our families, we do the right things, but we do it for the wrong reasons. Our motives can become tarnished, they become soured. We say things like, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Yes. We say those things and we make them pretty because we throw in those cute little spiritual jargons like, I prayed before I said this. I throw in, oh Lord, you know. But we can still have the wrong motives even though we, we're using the jargon. jargon. Because like Danny said, God is looking for what's in our heart. He is looking for what's in our heart. He's looking in our heart to see why we're doing what it is we're doing. And if we have the wrong motives, he is very much aware of it. We may fool one another, maybe even ourselves, but we're not fooling him. We're not fooling him. Are we doing things for the right motive? That's the question. Do we seek to advance ourselves or do we seek to honor others before ourselves? Do we good, do good work so that others will praise us and think us spiritual or because we are overflowing with a blessing to spread to others? That's questions we need to ask and we need to be honest with ourselves. Now in my experience, we are a mixture of motives. We, every one of us are. Some noble, some not so noble. As I read through this week's passage several times and I kept looking back at it, what I came to a realization is this. I came to a realization that I need the fruit of the Spirit to grow good, wholesome fruit in my life. I need the Lord to gently loosen the roots of weeds that have infested this plantation, this plantation, and lift them up. I need good work in me, not self-serving surface good, but the deep character of my Savior in an otherwise barren and needy heart. Now I said I, but I would venture to say most people sitting in this room can say I as well, if we are honest with ourselves. I hope no one in here is so dishonest with themselves that you think you've arrived and you don't need those things I just said. I hope not. Now, in this passage, I see the compassion of Jesus and the open invitation of God the Father. You and I have received an invitation to his table. God has invited us to his table for no other reason than the fact that he loves us so abundantly that he has seasoned us with grace, with his grace. And sometimes we even look at that and ask the question, why would God love me? I mean, really, do we need more in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in me should not perish but of everlasting life. Do we need more than that? I mean, if we do, then we need to start asking ourselves some serious questions here. Do we really trust God? Can we really take God as his word? Because if he needs to, every time we get up in the morning, come back and reiterate to us why he loves us, then the problem is not with God, the problem is with us. The problem is not with God, the problem is with us. So we look at our text, we're not gonna have time to read all of that. So we look at our text at verses 14, or uh, 15 through 24.
we see the invitation to the feast that was sent out in advance. And it was to an actual meal. On the day of the feast, the servant would announce that the, the meal was about to start. And what we find is that we see two similar events here, one in Matthew chapter 22, the other at Luke chapter 14. We see uh, uh, similar events here with different things happening. Uh, we don't have time to go over those today, uh, but if you would read Matthew 22, uh, verses 1 through 14, and as well as Luke chapter 14, uh, verses 15 through 24, you, you would get a chance to see a comparison of the meals there. 